This is Sound and Vision on KEXP. Asian Man Records is an influential ska and punk record label based out of California's San Jose suburbs. The label's only employee has been Mike Park. He's run and operated all the label's roles, from signing bands to stuffing records, all from his mom's garage. And he's been doing it for nearly 30 years. KXP's Dusty Henry spoke with Park to learn more about the label's history, the ethos that's kept it alive, and the bands Asian Man Records has broke along the way, including Less Than Jake and Alkaline Trio. Being an artist as well, like, has that given you back then and now, like perspective on how you want to run the label? Like what, what kind of things do you think about differently with that artist mindset operating a label? I feel like in, in my case, it's, it's a lot different. Even like people who have independent labels, I think they really still strive for success, which they should um, success for themselves, success for their artists. But in my case with Asian man, I've always tried to strive for less is more. Uh, and even having to scale back when I felt like things were getting too out of hand because Asian man is just me. I think a lot of people have this wrong perception that we're a much bigger label than we are because we've put out some releases that have done well. So I've always just tried to keep it under the control of what I can do. I still am doing the mail order. I'm still doing every facet of the label, accounting, Back in the day, going to, I guess it was Kinko's at the time, and making cut and paste art and ads and when zines were a thing, just sending out the ads. It was it was something that was fun. I wanted to be able to do it myself. And that's the only, that's the constant that's continued to this day. Tell me a little bit about how you landed on the name Asian Man Records. Uh, there was a Skank and Pickle song called Asian Man, uh, and it's like tongue in cheek about the stereotypes of Asian Americans. I'm sick of people always telling me the dog shouldn't be eaten as a delicacy. Yo, it tastes good as a sandwich meat. Heck, I like it and it's low in calories. And when I started the label, I wanted people to know it was a person of color that was running the label. I wanted there to be a face behind the company instead of some uh, just random whatever Joe Schmo records. I wanted people to know it is an Asian American and as someone who was involved in the ska and punk scene um, because there's not a, I felt it continue to feel there's very little representation for people of color in punk music. Yeah. And I've, I've seen you talk a bit about that before and, and particularly how seeing like Fishbone being pivotal for you to see like POC musicians and spaces that have been often dominated by white bands. Like, do you keep that, like when you're building the roster, like, is that something you're being intentional about? Like it seems, seems so on the outside looking in, but like, how, how do you maintain that as, as a label? The main thing I think above anything is I want to work with good people above the the sound of the the music above the um uh, racial makeup of the band or anything they've got to be good people like I, you could you could be a band that i if in my mind i'm like wow this is going to sell so well but if there's just one asshole in that band i just can't deal with it so that that's the first thing the second thing is i do Take note if there is a person of color in in the band. Uh, admittedly, it'll pique my interest of like, okay, well, there's an Asian American in this band. I'm going to listen to this right now, and mostly it's usually bad. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's not saying because it's an Asian American. Just most people who send me the demos, it's just bad. <laughs> sure. Um, but I, I do listen to it. I, it. It'll go to the top of the list if I see someone who looks like me. <laughs> Are you still operating out of your parents' garage, like your website says? Yeah, it's the exact same place. It's, uh, it started off, there's a two-car garage, and I started on one side of it. And I've taken over the entire garage now, and the entire downstairs. And I built a, a storage shed in the backyard to, to house dead stock. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... it's uh, it's cool. My mom, my, my dad passed away um, a, a few decades ago, but my mom, uh, I think she really enjoys it. She's 86 now, but she still likes, it's, it's fun for her to see like bands come, you know, she likes seeing 
people with funny hair, looking <laughs> hair, show up. And she always says the same thing to them. She says, you're a big star. <laughs> That's what she says. <laughs> oh, to sorry. every band. It's the same. It's her same line. She's like, you're going to be a big star. <laughs> In a, a broken English, she says it. I wanted to go through a few notable releases, and there's you know 390, so I'm bound to miss something, and feel free to sure. bring things up. What would you consider the first release? I'll see conflicting things out there. Uh, less than Jake Pescor. <laughs> We had met Less Than Jake in Gainesville. They opened up for us, gosh, I think probably the first time was maybe like 1993 or 94. And so I just asked them, I said, would you would you let us put out your record? And they said yes. And that was it. It was pretty much, you know, again, no contracts. It was just like, we'll just split everything 50-50. And so, man, when I put that out, it was... Ska was just about to explode. And so without even trying, that thing was selling like crazy. Uh, it was to the point where my, da- my parents are both like very strict, um, never happy with my choice of going into music. And so it wasn't until I started selling like a lesson, Jake in particular was bringing so much money where my dad was seeing the checks where he was just like, Oh, well, maybe this is okay that he's doing this. <laughs> but, wow, what a great uh, first release. It really made it easy for me to kind of uh, establish myself with, with record stores and distributors where people actually wanted to carry my stuff versus me begging them to carry it. Yeah, I mean, like, what a way to set the tone for the label. <laughs> oh, heck Yeah. <laughs> Another record I've heard you mention as being pretty pivotal for the label was um, Slapstick's self-titled record. Could you talk about that one? So Slapstick was a band from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, Most of them were from Elgin. And again, just lucky to be on tour and they opened up for Skank and Pickle at the Metro in Chicago. And I was just like, wow, these teenagers, they, they were all in high school and the place was going crazy for them. I think that's when I also realized that what a great um, position to be in as a like indie record label to be able to tour and you actually get to see these bands in their home markets open up for you. And that was a band that just stood out. I was like, okay. I've got to put out that record. And I just pulled them aside. I think the second time we went to Chicago, they opened up for us again. That's when I asked them if they would uh, let me put out their record. And I guess they're also a band. Their breakup was probably more beneficial to me versus if they had stayed together. Because after they broke up, the singer started a band called the Broadways along with the trumpet player, the bass player, guitarist, and drummer started a band called Tuesday. Those bands broke up, and that resulted into the Lawrence Arms and then into the Alkaline Trio. And it was just like the gifts that kept giving. And every band, they would ask me to put out their records. So I was like, oh, yeah, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. That, that kind of segues perfectly. Another one I wanted to talk about was Alkaline Trio's God Damn It. Which is a pretty big record for you, right? Massive. That was the game changer of just putting me on, an, I guess, a scale that I, was, um, I wasn't reaching for, but it put me at a level where I think that's where people confuse me for being a big label is because of the Alkaline Trio. We we're lucky enough to put out three records, but that first record, God damn it. I paid $990 for them to record that, which is insane. And at the time, Dan, the bass player, was still in Tuesday, and he had to, he was leaving for tour, so he actually recorded the backup vocals before the lead vocals, which is unheard of. No one does that. And But this record is still is perfect. When I listen to it, I, it's 
it's just a real record. I think it's it's going to go down in history if we look like 30 years from now, it'll just be a classic punk record in the same category as like a Descendants or Seven Seconds or a Social Distortion. It's that good. I would say it's my favorite record I've ever put out. And it sounded like the band wanted to put out another record with you after they were major label, like, talks stuff right yeah so their second record is called maybe i'll catch fire and maybe i'll catch fire and they had been offered a deal with mca i believe it was mca and i really encouraged them to do it i was like why not you know this is your career is a chance for you to make a living at this and they said yeah we just we just want to put it out with you and so i said okay Thank God they did. My goodness. <laughs> it really helped me because I definitely went into a lull for a few years in the, uh, I guess, uh, early 2000s. And that, that Alkaline Trio catalog really carried me through those dark years. Testament to the bonds you're making with all these groups. Yeah, no, for sure. But those, those dark years were because I was getting older. And as I was getting older, I kept putting out bands that were my age. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, sales are mediocre at best. And it took me a good, like look in the mirror of like, I got to start going to shows again, like the DIY shows. And so I, I started going to house shows all over the Bay area. And that's when I, I feel like the second birth of Asian man came through with bands like Andrew Jackson, Jihad, they're now AJJ. I could go off the deep end. I could kill all my best friends. Bomb the music industry. I don't love you anymore. No, this isn't some mistake. Lemuria. I want my hands. And then Joyce Manor sh- shortly after that. That was a very exciting part of Asian Man was being able to like really recreate the branding, if that makes sense. <laughs> or not recreate it, at least me like starting going back to shows, like being the oldest guy. I was always weird, like, okay, I'm the oldest guy here at every show, but finally feeling comfortable with it and being part of that uh, DIY scene again. And yeah, I mean, you'll be coming up on like the 30th anniversary of Asian Man Records in a couple of years. Like, is this a thing you want to keep going until, you know, we all eventually meet our end? I guess that sounds morbid, but like, is it you, you want to keep it going forever? Do you see an end to the to the label? I don't. As long as it, it continues to be fun. If it's no fun, then I, I don't want to do it. Um, I was just offered recently, a couple months ago, a, a big label offered to buy it for $3 million dollars. And I was like, God, that's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, it's like, why? What do I get? What am I going to do with that money? It's not, it, it, it really doesn't serve a purpose. I live such a simple life. So I, I actually enjoy what I do. So I, I think putting a price on this doesn't make any sense. But if it's no fun anymore, then that's when it stops. But it's awesome. It's still, it's still super rewarding to work with work with bands and seeing their growth and seeing the joy in their face when they have the first uh, like 12 inch vinyl in their hands as their first release that that's what i really enjoy that was mike park talking about asian man records with kexp's dusty henry and that was Sound and Vision. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, rate it, and review it. KXP is a listener-funded station. Consider giving a one-time $20 donation to support Sound and Vision at kexp.org sound. Thanks for listening.